Good afternoon, one and all. I, Ms. Priyanka Bandi Vadekar, welcome our delegates and participants in this second half session of e conference entitled Global Pharmaceutical Challenges in Drug Development for the Treatment of Cancer and Their Impact in Regulatory Management. A conference is gathering of people who singly can do nothing but together can. So, Moving towards session, I give it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our delegate, Dr. Pravin Kumar Ingre. Dr. Pravin Kumar Ingre, working as a senior lecturer since 2014 in the Department of Pharmacy Practice School of Pharmacy International Medical University, Malaysia, and served as a chief editor of the Journal of Pharmaceutical Research and clinical practice, which is published under a well-known publisher, Walters Kluwer, since 2011. He has a guide for UG and PG students. Sir is a founder and president of Harivishwa Education Society. Dr. Ingray has 14 years of teaching experience and 10 years of experience as a chief editor. Sir has published more than 50 research, review, short papers in national and international journals and participated in more, in more than 35 seminars, conferences, workshops, trainings at national and international level. Dr. Pravin Kumar received research grant of RM, that is Ringgit Malaysia, with a total amount more than 1 lakh for research project of UG and PG student from IMU University. He is actively involved in designing, developing, curriculum mapping and content delivery of newly launched master in pharmacy practice, that is a postgraduate course with a clinical research specialization, and also contributed to other healthcare programs, curriculum designing such as postgraduate diploma in diabetes management and education. Apart from teaching and administration, Dr. Ravin Kumar also involved in developing teaching tools, teaching and coordinating other academic activities or sessions like blending learning, objective structured clinical examinations, skill development dispensing practical, case-based learning, problem-based learning, pharmaceutical care plans, computer-aided learning, e-learning, flipped classes, etc. He is a member of several professional sciences like APTI and Indian Hospital Pharmacist Association, that is IHPA. With this short introduction, I request our passionate and venerable Speaker Dr. Pravin Kumar Ingres, sir, to commence his presentation. Please, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for my introduction. Nice introduction. Okay. And uh, first of all, uh, at the outset, I would like to thanks to Kokan Nanpit Rahul Dharkar College of Pharmacy and Research Institute, Karzat. And thank you for inviting me as a resource person for this AICT sponsored e-conference. And also I would like to thanks to Dr. Mohan Kale, Dr. Bharat Tekade and all his team members. Okay, so as we are meeting the first time uh, online, so this is the, the opportunity we got because of COVID-19. And today's my session and talk is related with the evolution of anti-cancer drug therapy from manufacturing to clinical practice. So what I'm going to cover here is, uh, because I'm not uh, focusing on the areas, those are already given in the textbook. So out of textbook, you know, the other things, so what are the clinical practice related things and then the evidence based practices and then uh, what are the, you know, the innovations are going on in the field of anti-cancer drug therapy evolution. So mainly I am focusing here on the clinical practice side uh, with the some example that will give you some insight of the topic and that will be beneficial for all of you. So I'm considering that today's audience is like 
from you know the diploma pharmacy student the b pharmacy student as well as the postgraduate those are doing the phd and also uh, those uh, faculty members so i would like to thanks to all those participated in this aict sponsored e conference and attending this uh, webinar uh, of this uh, the college that arranged the uh, the things okay so let us start uh, uh, with the presentation just i will check okay so now it's okay i think uh, everyone can see the the powerpoint okay so this is just a short introduction about uh, the university uh, where i'm working so i am working in imu that is international medical university and that is the malaysia's first and most established private medical health sciences university with 28 years of dedicated focus in healthcare education imu has a setara 2017 rating of 6 stars that is outstanding and is the highest one so out of 6 uh, imu uh, got the the 6 stars under the mature university category so here i am working in international medical university in kuala lumpur malaysia so this is about uh, the youtube channel so I, i in this covid 19 situation also i have given some talk related with the the some motivational uh, things so like uh, self reflection and other uh, the, the topics related with the uh, actually the farm d and also the clinical pharmacy and also for the the pharmacy students so it will be helpful for all the student from diploma to the the farm d b farm m farm and also those are pursuing their phd or planning to have their phd in the near future so it will be beneficial for them so just uh, you can have this qr code and later you can visit and see the youtube channels and related topics if you are interested in in particularly Uh, in those topics so th th this is the code generally uh, I, i mentioned the uh, we'll start with the positive code okay so each and every session i will start with the some code so this is the code i i uh, actually made uh, for this uh, you know the stress management uh, obviously in the cancer also one of the cause like some of the literature already mentioned that the the cause is might be the stress so that is a triggering factor so i'm not telling that is a very you know the the important factor but it is a factor that is indirectly coming into the picture whenever you know the patient is having the stress and anger so that ultimately going cumulative way and it leads to sometime the you know the changes in the the structure of the gene and ultimately it may lead to sometime the cancer because ultimately the the stress is reducing the immune power of the patient so obviously if there is a low immunity there is a more chances of getting the infection getting the, the chances of this type of non communicable disease cancer is not alone in that category there are others also the many things are there okay the many disease condition the non communicable disease so this is the quote uh, think positively and choose your own experience as a weapon against the the stress so this is the way you need to think positively and you need to have the healthy mind so it's the mental health is very important so as per like we are talking about the cancer we need to have the stress management also because this is not only related with the patient but the caretaker those are the family members those are also suffering from that condition also so if someone get you know uh, diagnosed as a cancer in the family so obviously the the uh, you know the, the those are taking care of that patient in the family also will get affect so in that way we need to have the stress management and that's how the role of meditation and then the yoga comes here and many literature already they they, they cited the role in that way so that is how uh, we need to learn how we can nurture our brain in a positive way instead of thinking in a negative way ultimately the thinking in a negative way will impact your own body and also it will uh, in the long term it will damage yourself so so in this condition we need to be how uh, we need to think in a positive way
so uh, there are some titles i covered in this session so the first one is the background so in background uh, we will try to see uh, what are those cancer particularly related with the, the the globally and also in the indian scenario so that will be helpful to plan your research in your future accordingly and also you can have the literature search uh, in that aspect okay so that's why i given the background here uh, letting you know that what are those particular top five cancers in men and women in Indian setup as well as in globally because uh, whenever you are trying to have your research setting your research it's not about the local context and the national way you're thinking but it's all about how you globally think and that's how you plan your research so that will be helpful for your uh, the, the coming uh, you know uh, the those suffering from the cancer the community okay so that's how uh, we we discuss in the background in the introduction uh, we'll discuss about what are those uh, particular the cancer treatment available and what are those uh, the 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 opportunities and challenges uh, in these conditions okay the third one is the manufacturing aspect i try to give some manufacturing aspect as per uh, my knowledge and also whatever the literature i search so i given here some uh, innovative way how the manufacturing company are collaborating with each other and also how they are utilizing their premises and they are coming with the novel drug delivery system so that's how uh, the novel drug delivery system role comes here as like we have the conventional way of uh, treatment like you know uh, the the what we can say is a cancer chemotherapy the radiation therapy and many more like immunomodulation and many more uh, therapies are there in the cancer but how uh, about the future we need to think because uh, as we know that there are many adverse effects related with the the uh, the conventional you know the the cancer chemotherapeutic agent so we need to think and move forward to have the the better molecule in a future so in that way what are the aspects that i am going to cover in the manufacturing aspect the clinical practice aspect obviously as a pharmacist we need to know what is our role in a cancer management especially as if we are a hospital pharmacist or is, is a, you know the community pharmacy and obviously it's a lifelong learning process we need to use a lot of literature we need to have the you know uh, study a, a lot of literature to have the lifelong learning process and that should be obvious evidence based practice so that's how uh, the clinical practice aspects important in the management of cancer as well as the policy so what are the policy available what are the clinical practice guidelines are available so we are using that guidelines we are using that policy and obviously the role of policy makers are also important in that aspect okay and lastly i i want to give some message to you uh, regarding the, the the pharmacy education and the quality education okay so we'll start with the the background first okay so whenever uh, you're thinking about the global scenario as well as the national scenario so global scenario what comes here in the cancer treatment and also in the cancer management is that leading cause so cancer is a leading cause as all of you know so this is a just uh, you know the revision what uh, we know already and this is a recent article what we have uh, that is the you know the valid article we can say rather because uh, there are many uh, sites websites and also literature you will get whenever you are searching in a, you know any search engine but you know the authenticity of the reference is matter that's why whenever you are doing your research do the uh, you know the literature search in a proper way so that you can have the some uh, valid references and that is very authentic you know that is very important so because uh, you will get a lot of information re regarding the cancer but how it is you know uh, reliable that is very important so that's why i am focusing here uh, with the recent articles and showing you how you have the opportunity as a pharmacist in coming time to do your research to do your work job 
properly in whenever your community or you know, uh, the clinical pharmacist or a hospital pharmacist okay so this is the second leading cause of death after the cardiovascular complication or the cardiovascular risk factor so globally if you are thinking this is a second but in india now it's coming you know the second and is going towards first place because nowadays if you are looking at the you know the digit the statistics of indian origin the cancer is growing very fastly that because of many reasons that we are going to see here okay so now estimated approximately is 9.6 million deaths in 2018 this is a who the world health organization data and globally one in six death is occurred due to the cancer and approximately 70 percent of deaths occurred in low and middle income countries okay and one third deaths occur due to the some reasons that might be related with the behavioral and also the dietary risk factors so what are those uh, behavior and uh, dietary risk factors so these are the risk factors the first one is body mass index okay so obviously uh, the body mass index is high nowadays because of a lot of factors like increase in the body weight okay so how we calculate the body mass index is the body weight and height in meter square right so like body mass index is nowadays is not in control because of many factors like lifestyle and how the person are eating and maybe like you know uh, overeating so overeating is one of the cause of stress so stress that leads to the overeating and obviously the person will get the the high body mass index so that is one of the factor risk factor related with the cancer that is reported by world health organization so these are the the you know the combined factors the another one is fruit and vegetable intake so decrease fruit and vegetable intake is observed in many countries globally it's not about any single country so like you know the western style of food and all other things that obviously minimizes the intake of fruit and vegetable in the diet and also physical activity like most of the people they are doing their uh, the you know the work online or something like delivering online and they have their busy schedule many reasons are there and that's how the physical activity goes down next comes here in tobacco use so tobacco use might be like you know the smoking cigarette or chewing tobacco it's like you know the 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 vapor one or non vapor one so tobacco use is already dangerous and reported many times and one of the cause in indian setup is a tobacco use and also the alcohol use so there are many states in india and there are many reports reported by the icmr and also the uh, world health organization those factors responsible for the the development of cancer in each state of the india so obviously we know that uh, this is a you know this is a growing burden of cancer in india from antiquity from a long time there is a growth and now in uh, the earlier time before two three years we 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 saw the picture of growing is you know tremendously so that's how uh, we need to have the proper cancer therapy for the patient to have the minimize side effect and to have the better patient safety outcome okay so this is the the tobacco use important risk factor approximately 22 percent of the cancerous death occur due to this tobacco use cancer causing infection so mainly uh, those patients having the cancer taking some anti cancer or maybe having the radiation having some certain you know side effect like mucositis is one of the common and most of the people have the mucositis in their uh, chemotherapy and also they are suffering from some infection due to the the cancer and that is hepatitis and human papilloma virus that is hpv so many articles are there related with the hepatitis and hpv if you are interested you can go further and uh, do the the literature search in that way so 25% of the cancer cases uh, were observed in low and middle income countries also the late stage presentation like, like you know the diagnosis is late stage like in a stage 3 or stage 4 so that's how the diagnosis plays an important role in a cancer treatment if the patient is diagnosed at the latter stage 
obviously the rate of mortality will be more and the patient may have the survival chances is very less like example what i can mention here is a pancreatic cancer because the pancreatic cancer in most of the case is very rare cancer but still uh, it's affecting a lot of people because they are getting you know diagnosed at the latter time of their uh, the stage and that's how uh, they are not able to survive their life so how uh, this actually the cancer having impact economic impact so this is a, a 2010 data approximately us dollar 1.16 trillion is the the impact the economic impact due to this cancer and one in five country that is a low and middle income countries they have the necessary important data to drive for the cancer policy so that's how like uh, in the conference title is also there the policy how we are going to impart the policy in the cancer treatment so many country they have their uh, policies they have some clinical practice guideline they have some consensus like you know the the general comment together uh, that's how they make a policy uh, like in india we have international uh, this one indian council of medical research right icmr so icmr uh, they are also playing a role to have some policies regarding some generalized cancer and also to the specialized cancer like breast cancer the gastric cancer the gast uh, the cancer of mouth and also the lip so that covers all the our uh, the, the oral uh, mucosa and all other things right so that's how uh, they they made a policy the most common cancers so this is a global data so these are the most common cancer and you can see here the how many people were getting affected because of these common cancers globally and this is the second figure you can see here how cancer lead to the death so these are the top five that is a lung cancer up to the breast cancer uh, those people are getting you know affected and having the mortality in that case okay so this is the cancer uh, statistics related with the india so one woman dies of cervical cancer every 8 minute in india so how, why i i want to showcase this uh, these digits and you know uh, why i want to aware all of you to know how the cancer is you know uh, tremendously growing in an indian setup and what particular measures we need to have as a pharmacist as a researcher as a scientist so uh, we have basically uh, many more uh, research uh, actually the the scope in a cervical cancer so many studies already done in the uh, in this area the cervical cancer in the indian setup itself if you are going through the literature but still uh, there is a scope uh, whenever it comes to the formulation side and also with the the pharmacy uh, pharmaceutical care planning by the pharmacist again two women uh, newly diagnosed with the breast cancer so out of that one woman dies because of the same thing the diagnosis at the latter stage might be at the stage of 3 and 4 that's how the screening is very important in a breast cancer and that's why the many now organization they are coming with the different guidelines and also the screening program for the women those particularly staying in a, you know in the rural area or in urban urban area of the india so estimated people uh, living with this disease condition uh, the cancer including all the cancer around 2.25 million and it might be going and going nowadays if you are thinking about the recent data so every year uh, there are few new cases patients registered over the time and that is more over uh, like you know 11 lakhs every year so cancer related deaths this is near about more than 7 lakhs okay and this is how we can categorize like risk of developing cancer before the age of 75 years so risk of getting the cancer in male is 9.81% and in female is 9.42% so these are the total deaths due to the cancer in 
okay so uh, here you can go through in the detail if you want to go uh, uh, with the who guidelines and also with the who website and also the the cancerindia.org.in under the icmr so here you can see top five uh, particularly the cancer uh, those uh, particularly occur in a indian scenario with the men and women so these are the cancer so that's how uh, we can start our research focusing on those areas particularly uh, those are you know the thirst area what we can say uh, in terms of you know the getting the grant for the your research and also having your research in a uh, in a planning your research in a proper way so that might be related with your preclinical site or in the the clinical site uh, when it comes with the industry setup so what are those uh, cancer treatment i'm not going uh, much in detail uh, with this historical part so as we know that uh, 3000 bc we started with the surgery that you know uh, th that time only there were option is a surgery earlier uh, before coming the radiation therapy chemotherapy and all other therapy like hormonal therapy and uh, you know the immunomodulation therapy and nowadays we have the targeted therapy also that is you know by studying the dna sequencing target uh, we have the targeted therapy in a cancer patient so that's how we differentiate uh, the conventional drug therapy uh, of the, the chemotherapy with the targeted drug therapy okay so th that's how uh, the targeted drug therapy nowadays is uh, mainly popular in uh, in the the cancerous patient whenever it comes to the cancerous patient and that's how the clinical research is also going on to focus mainly on the targeted therapy to know more about the proteins those are causing the cancer though those are causing you know the dna uh, the gene particularly the gene responsible for that and also some literature they are reporting about the biomarkers so we need to have the proper biomarkers estimation that's how we can target a specific cell to have the less adverse effect compared to our conventional chemotherapeutic drugs okay so this is about uh, the introduction so after the, the the background so background is very important whenever you are planning with your you know uh, the research study and also uh, with your uh, any literature search that's why i given all the statistics here uh, introduction why why all the questions mark here in this session it's not all about what i'm revealing to you but again at the same time i want to think in that way you know uh, i need to brainstorm you if you are really interested to do your clinical uh, research in the cancer therapy and also in the preclinical side so we need to think where does the research start actually so wherever there is a question mark the research starts there so that is a simple answer what i can give to my opinion so whenever you find something missing in the literature so that's how your mind triggers and you start thinking over that and you will design your research in that way that's why we called as a research question okay so what is the need of time you you, you need to think in that way because we have a lot of drug therapy i'm not going to talk on all that aspect because i saw the all the other topics in the e uh, conference here uh, so some like you know they are uh, specifically talking about some target and some receptor and some you know the specialized therapy but here uh, i want to how the focus all over the cancer treatment regimen uh, including the clinical practice aspect and that's how uh, i want to brainstorm you here uh, to the audience in my session so we need to think about what is the need of time today's time so we need to think in other way instead of you know uh, going through the flow and going through the the normal way like you know uh, we have the clinical trials the clinical research that's we are doing you know uh, clinical trials in a phase one two three and four but how reliable that particular clinical trials whenever it comes to the cancer treatment right so we need to think to change the model of clinical trials also in some way because uh, uh, some cancerous treatment is mainly maybe we uh, they evolved for the one type of cancer the breast cancer might be that molecule is also helpful for another you know type of cancer so that's how uh, we need to somewhat change the, the the way we are doing the clinical research and also the clinical trials and that's how we can move forward in our 
uh, research in the coming time so that is the way uh, that is a time actually we need to think in that way and we need to have some intervention rather doing you know all the things in a conventional way so that's how we we can uh, you know have the proper treatment compared to the conventional treatment and also by that way we can survive the cancerous patient the mortality as well as the morbidity because cancer is not only alone because there are many concomitant you know the comorbidity the comorbid conditions are there so we need to think in that way and also we need to tailor uh, the, the medication as a pharmacist in that way so we need to have the the less mortality as well as morbidity so that's how the treatment options the role of pharmacist comes here in the pharmaceutical care planning so as a pharmacist uh, we cannot compare directly with the western countries and the indian scenario but still now with the pharmd uh, the student now the, the there is a growth of you know uh, the participation of clinical pharmacist in clinical decision making with the healthcare team and also with the doctor so that's how uh, the pharmacist plays an important role in a treatment option monitoring the adverse effect that mainly in the pharmacovigilance uh, that might be in a, you know in the clinical trials and also in the hospital setup the targeted therapy so we need to think in targeted therapy also the biomarkers and also the future clinical trials as i mentioned to you so targeted therapy uh, how i can define in a simple way to you here is like you know we need to have the target is a targeted drug delivery system like what we can explain in a pharmaceutics uh, the way the in a their uh, the way right so targeted therapy mainly targets that cancerous cell growth and how we can reduce the the adverse effect to the normal cell growth so that's how it is differing from the the conventional therapy to the targeted therapy but at the same time targeted therapy is also having the problems like you know the drug resistance so whenever you are giving this targeted therapy over the time for a longer duration the patient might get the drug resistance problem so in that way we need to check the bio availability of the drug at that particular target and also the the other drugs that might be the placebo and also it comes in the randomized clinical trial that what treatment we have in our olden time and how this new treatment will be more effective than compared to the conventional one so there are a lot of factors need to be have in mind whenever we are thinking about the targeted therapy and obviously we need to have the biomarkers to see uh, where there is a mutation occurs where there is a gene alteration occurs where there is a protein that mainly you know involved in a cancerous cell growth because uh, at the same time uh, as a researcher we need to know that where is a difference actually in a cancerous cell and a living normal cell there are many difference in the cancerous growth and in a normal cell growth right in a normal uh, human being there are many cells in the human body and that's how they work differently each living cell work differently and the also cancerous cell will uh, you know work differently that's how we need to study first the cell their protein their mutation their genes how that is getting mutated and you know many factors that's how we get a proper biomarkers so once we get a proper biomarkers we can test with the patient and somehow we can make a proper drug regimen that might be targeted drug therapy or also uh, you might be some uh, somewhere you heard about the precision medicine or also the personalized medicine right so personalized medicine uh, as you all of know like it's a cost right it's a very costly so it's not possible in all the way but but the still researcher are doing their best to have the precision medicine or the you know the personalized medicine particularly in, in the the cancerous patient so these are the other factors uh, mainly you know uh, the, those are the hurdles actually and sometime if you are taking as a opportunity you know so these challenges particularly you can you know uh, convert to the opportunities always so this is a uh, like you know briefly i given those are the challenges and opportunities in the clinical research setup in india particularly the diagnosis the late diagnosis and the patient is diagnosed at the stage 3 or 
the clinical research we don't have that much of setup and also sometimes uh, there are certain few rare cancers we don't get the number of uh, actually the people in the clinical trials that is one of the challenge uh, we are having in the clinical research whenever it comes to the manufacturing site uh, obviously the setup for anti cancer drug development the manufacturing is costly and that's how uh, there is a collaboration in between the many pharmaceutical company nowadays and they are working together to have the better molecule in a near future okay i'm not going to um, tell you uh, detail in that because of the time constraint okay so infrastructure already uh, you know that infrastructure is also lacking somewhere uh, in the clinical research as well as in the good manufacturing practice and only those are having the you know uh, the who certified uh, who gmp those can manufacture this particular type of drugs with the all type of sops the standard operating procedure and the screening program obviously it will be helpful in a breast cancer patient to detect in early stage and that's how we can minimize the mortality in the women in the india gene and protein so that's how i explained earlier gene and protein how they are playing important role in a cancer treatment regimen and we need to know which gene particularly responsible for causing which type of cancer which protein is particularly uh, causing which type of uh, you know the cancer and how we can inhibit that protein to you know inhibit the further growth or the tremendous growth of the cancer in the human body okay so these are the manufacturing aspect so this is the conventional therapy versus targeted therapy as i told you before okay so significant advances uh, have been made in the field of drug delivery okay but still the patients uh, have a number of unmet needs offering ample opportunities to the drug companies as well as to the pharmacists to do the research and you know uh, to grow further in a cancer treatment regimen so researcher uh, and the scientific uh, scientists they have their own strategies and the target area but these have met with uh, limited success in the clinical development phase so as you know that you know uh, in the past few decades if you see there are many components there are many molecules if you are going through the fda the food drug administration uh, website you can see the mo many molecules come up in the cancer category from the last uh, few decades okay and that's how uh, there is a scope in the in the cancer treatment development okay so these are the some unmet needs that observe at the the manufacturing site so the first one is the infrastructure the the facility required for the clinical trial and also the the collaboration because uh, developing a cancer treatment is not the job of one person or one you know the faculty or in one profession so this is not all about the pharmacy but it's always like you know uh, collaborating with each other having the molecular uh, biology person or having the you know those are uh, mainly related with the gene and also with the uh, particularly diagnosis of the cancer and also those are involved in the policy making the patient uh, uh feedback is also important uh, whenever it comes with the treatment regimen or preparing any new drug molecule because the patient that is all uh, uh, is a like you know the the last factor we need to consider as a patient because the patient involvement is very important whenever it comes with the cancer treatment so that's why the feedback from them is uh, always important okay so next here is a targeted uh, therapy so like drug delivery system and delivering drug compounds targeted cells for a specific time period and what is our ultimate aim is to have the minimal or no impact on the other healthy cells so this is the main criteria for the the targeted drug delivery thereby uh, we can limit the painful side effect of the conventional uh, cancerous drug the the, the you know the can, uh, chemotherapeutic drug so genetics and proteins so already i mentioned you uh, here is a gene role and also the protein role is also important and that's how uh, we need to know also about the biomarkers whenever it comes to the novel drug delivery so delivering more than one drug at one target site is 
a key important factors and that's how this is a challenge actually in the pharmaceutical field like you know delivering that particular drug uh, at one particular type of you know target and also uh, at one point of time this is a, a major uh, the challenge in the development of the uh, new drug chemical entity for the cancer okay and as well as the bioavailability the target site remains a key challenge that delivering that particular and having the you know uh, the concentration of the drug at that site so this is a key role of the uh, particular delivering the bioavailability okay so these are the some innovations okay variable injectors like you can see in a coming time so some uh, already uh, they are in clinical phase okay so these are the innovations particularly uh, occurring in the cancer uh, drug development wearable injectors is like you know looking like uh, what we can say is a insulin pain and it's a, a type of injector that injecting the 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 drug okay implantable devices it's like same like uh, the insulin pump what we can uh, have the the appearance okay nanoparticle uh, base oral drugs and there is a nano medicine nano medicine is a vast subject and you know the, there are many uh, opportunities to do research in that aspect with the cancer therapy arrayed micro injections okay and intranasal drug delivery especially the intranasal drug delivery is related with the the pain management in a cancerous patient and that's how uh, we can deal with the the pain management in a cancerous patient uh, with using this type of uh, you know innovation the drug delivery the intranasal uh, there are many uh, again other things like transdermal patches in some countries already the transdermal patches are using for the pain management and some countries they are uh, still doing some uh, clinical trials in this aspect okay so this uh, uh, this is about the policy makers uh, the role of policy makers also important in uh, the manufacturing of the drug to have the minimization in the cost of the drug and also at the same time we can think about the generic medicine also so that's how we can minimize the the the, the cost of the cancerous drug but now that option is very limited uh, with the um, most of the countries and obviously uh, the patient feedback is also important like many patient they want uh, you know pain free needle technology or you know the pain free injection as like you know the insulin injection the patient can take at any time in their home instead of cancer treatment we need to have the specialized person and you know we need to reconstitute the drug and accordingly we need to give that particular dose to the patient so that's how uh, there there is a like you know the skills required from the medical side so that's how uh, the, the patient given some feedback uh, in the the past few years and this is the way we can move forward and implement this technology this feedback and improve further to have the better outcome the patient safety right so th th this is about uh, the manufacturing aspect uh, what about the clinical aspect the clinical practice aspect so uh, obviously it will start from the patient safety aspect whenever we are talking about the patient and as a pharmacist we need to have the the proper patient safety aspect uh, and uh, you know um, we need to uh, prevent the harm as well as uh, it's a less chances of harm or the less patient harm and how we achieve this outcome by monitoring certain you know uh, the things like the, the the patient those are having the hepatic dysfunction those function those patient having the renal failure so in that category of patient as a cancerous patient as a pharmacist we need to monitor certain parameters in those cases like serum creatinine okay the renal failure patients we need to have the serum creatinine hepatic dysfunction obviously we need to monitor the liver enzymes okay that's how we monitor uh, different kind of uh, you know the the profile the, the the parameters and that's how we assure the patient safety in that aspect and that's how uh, the world health organization they took an initiative last year and they launched a campaign uh, to speak about the patient safety and that this is the initiative uh, as a pharmacist we should take uh, as a uh, you know the clinical pharmacy aspect so this is uh, the clinical pharmacy aspect like patient safety so this is a very broad topic 
uh, even though we cannot explain uh, with the limited time patient safety okay so that comes uh, from the the patient outcome and also monitoring the adverse drug reactions and you know uh, prevention of the adr and how the patient have the drug compliance the the proper drug therapy and also the the patient counseling aspect that also comes here in the patient safety the next point here is a patient centered care so as like we are taking a feedback from the patient and also we are counseling the patient how to take medicines and how to avoid the adverse effect and when to contact with the physician if you have certain type of warning symptoms you know and again in that way the medication adherence is very important also in the the cancerous treatment because whenever if the patient is not having the proper medication adherence obviously it may lead with the drug resistance problem and further that will have the many complications in the near future for that patient so physician and as well as the pharmacist they need to use the evidence based practice guideline or the clinical practice guidelines so here in malaysia uh, uh, the ministry of health they are using the clinical practice guidelines so for the many cancerous treatment they have their own clinical practice guidelines so with the you know all the guidelines the diagnostic criteria and also the treatment strategy in that in indian setup uh, as like uh, you know uh, for the cancerous patient we have you know the some policies or the guidelines that we can uh, find out on the icmr guidelines like indian council of medical research so nowadays in recent time they are uploading many guidelines for the different type of uh, cancerous prevention and also the management and as well as diagnosis okay so symptom management so in many cancers as you know there are many symptoms like you know that might be due to the cancer and that might be due to the you know the the cancer drug treatment that is uh, nausea vomiting hair loss mucositis and many more okay so in that way we need to counsel the patient with the symptoms and how to manage that okay pharmacovigilance is a adverse drug reaction monitoring and that includes mainly the how uh, we counsel the patient to monitor their adverse effect and to report to the the pharmacist or to the the physician or to the nursing staff or any other healthcare professional so that they can report to the national pharmacovigilance center and that's how it goes to the world health organization center and that will be helpful for the 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 in the near future for the healthcare professionals so this is the again another role of the clinical pharmacist is the financial and the resource and also the insurance so as a clinical pharmacist uh, again the obviously the patient will be guided by the pharmacist in aspect of the financial crisis and also what are those particular organization they are dealing with the financial resources those are not able to pay the treatment cost so in western countries this practice is going on but still there is a scope in an indian setup for the pharmacist to do uh, the counseling the patient in that aspect okay uh, the insurance or might be the the financial resources available for the cancer patient okay the nutrition obviously the nutrition is the factor that also uh, helpful to you know build up the immunity of the patient so a role of pharmacist in nutrition guiding them the diet is also important and this is a, another scope for the the pharmacist to do uh, something in the the nutrition aspect the palliative care this is a very broad topic and that includes the care in a chronic illness patient particularly in the cancer patient uh, in a pancreatic cancer or all other types of cancer whenever the patient is at the last stage of the cancer and in this palliative care mainly we are focusing on the patient health care as well as the the family members how we can give the support to them uh, mainly in the emotional uh, way whenever they have the emotional stress and that's how the palliative care roles come here in the the clinical practice aspects of the the cancer patient okay so uh, this is about the palliative care and the, the role of pharmacist and also uh, we can increase the quality of life of the patient in that way 
okay so these are the resources you can use uh, for uh, getting uh, the the extra you know the the literature or the recent uh, movement going in the cancer treatment or in the the, the policy making uh, whenever it comes to the particular you know the globally or maybe at the national site the national uh, setup okay so these are the some uh, articles that will be helpful uh, for you as a pharmacist to optimize the drug use in anti cancer uh, drug and in the clinical setup okay so these are the some principles of chemotherapy uh, these are the national cancer institute and here you can get more information about the targeted cancer therapies okay and how that differs from the conventional uh, therapy and also what are the advantages what are the drawbacks all the things you can get here so why why i have given here like you know this is the reliable way how you can uh, search the information so this is another uh, way like how your immunity plays a role and immunomodulators mainly how immunotherapy will be helpful in a cancerous patient so this is the uh, us fda uh, website from here you can see what are those drug approved for the the treatment of you know the cancer and which type of uh, particular uh, which company produced that and then uh, manufacturing and everything right so this is about the last part uh, from my uh, presentation is a pharmaceutical care okay so pharmaceutical care mainly includes all the healthcare professionals together and uh, why this pharmaceutical care for the pharmacist is to improve the outcome oriented pharmacy practice and also it is a patient centered and pharmacist will work along with the patient as well as the healthcare providers to promote the health and prevent the disease condition and how we do that because uh, we need to assess the patient in that way we need to monitor the patient okay initiate a proper treatment regimen and modify the medication use okay so that's how the western uh, the, the the countries they are working together to have the the proper drug regimen for the patients and that should be obviously it should be effective and the 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 outcome base okay so these are the elements of pharmaceutical care like you know the professionalism so obviously if you are working in all together in a healthcare team so you need to have the professionalism involve the patient in the care treatment okay and explain the patient what are the you know the the cancerous treatment regimens are for and then how you are going to deal with that whenever there is adverse effect how can deal with that how to take the medicine at a proper time with the proper dose with the proper you know the route of administration and each and everything that's how you can build up the patient confidence in the treatment regimen okay and uh, that's how you need to maintain your moral as well as the ethics to your profession and clinical decision making so nowadays there is a uh, the, the the growing factors like you know you need to take a decision from the patient point of view also whenever the patient initiating some therapy like chemotherapy or might be the radiation therapy so we need to take a decision uh, you know from the the patient also whether he is able to adopt that or not if not then uh, obviously we need to think about the other therapies available for the patient as like you know the targeted therapy is not suitable for all the patient it's depend of a lot of factors like you know comorbidity and all other factors the type of cancer the stage of cancer equity in healthcare like the same like you know the poor people as well as the rich people they will get all the treatment same for all the cancer that is that's how the equity role comes here in the healthcare and obviously if you want to treat the patient properly you know you need to know the all patient data like you know the age of the patient right from the beginning sex occupation allergy status family and social history medical and medication history because uh, there are some trigger factors that contribute to the the progression of cancer that's why the role of each and every component is important here in the the clinical data management in the clinical database so again the role of pharmacist here in the medication adherence and also the patient uh, also the pharmacist can also uh, let 
from uh, the patient knows that what is the cost effective treatment available where there is a generic medicine available in case if it is available okay but this is a very rare uh, opportunity now but might be in the coming time we have the lot of opportunities in this aspect also medication compliance okay so sometimes the patient may have the fear because of the side effect because of the risk and that's how uh, the role of pharmacist comes here in the medication compliance and you can tell the patient how to avoid the side effect how to minimize that when to take drug particularly before uh, food or after food or you know uh, with other concomitant drugs because some drugs may have the drug interaction problem also because this cancer patient may have the other comorbidities and taking lot of medication at the same time that's why we need to think in a multi dimensional way to treat the patient to have the better patient uh, safety outcome okay and development of drug therapy plan so that's why the the role of pharmacists to develop their drug therapy plan is important to see all other aspect to see all other what are the medication the patient is taking apart from the cancerous therapy okay and to know your medicine by the patient so that's how the patient involvement will be you know you can increase the patient involvement in the their own therapy okay intervention medic modification of the therapeutic plan so talking with the physician and changing the drug if there is a drug interaction that's how we can work together with the physician and all other the pharma uh, the, the healthcare staff okay and final outcome obviously we are all doing this to minimize the medication error to have the proper patient safety and obviously as we discussed earlier we are using the evidence based medicine we are using the lot of clinical practice guidelines also the clinical literature because as you know that you know the pandemic the corona pandemic nowadays we are getting the you know uh, daily you know some latest news like you know what are the drugs we can use in a you know corona disease condition because this is a newly uh, evolving pandemic and still we are learning from that okay and that's how we uh, improve the quality of life in the the cancer patient the pharmaceutical care plan that is again uh, the role of clinical pharmacist comes here to have the plan of the medicine for the the cancerous patient and that's how we achieve a positive outcome based treatment approach working together in a healthcare team and this is a research perspective in a cancerous therapy in a in a cancerous uh, you know the 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 treatment okay so think accordingly like what i explained to you earlier like you know where does the research starts okay have some pilot study for that have some experimental study or might be the observational study so that's how uh, you get warm up in your research and then you can start with your main research okay so might be like uh, you can do the re systematic reviews like you know meta analysis also there the network meta analysis this is a new uh, upcoming branch is coming now to have the meta analysis to uh, you know getting all the evidence based research question answer from that and also as you know uh, some of you might be heard about the artificial intelligence the machine learning this is a new aspect coming here okay so just what you can do here to give the proper keywords okay in artificial intelligence and machine learning so only the thing like you know the machine don't know uh, the, the 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 keywords but whenever you are giving a proper keywords to the machine or artificial intelligence uh, they will do work for you and then you will get data related to that particular cancer say suppose you are doing research in a, some uh, particular breast cancer so what you can collect the data from here is to give a proper keyword and then you can collect all the global data from this artificial intelligence and also from the machine learning but uh, obviously you need to have the access right to the, the the data that is available with the government side so if you are having that then it will be easy for you to do the machine learning and move forward in your research okay you can do some social media based research like some of the research article now publishing with the doing the research with the you know uh, using whatsapp and you know the questionnaire uh, with that and uh, you know the the 
the measuring and monitoring the outcome of the treatment by using the whatsapp group even you know so this this is how we can uh, think innovative and then we can uh, do our research so obviously uh, patient outcome based research is very much appreciated and important in a chronic condition so these are the uh, future prospects so we need to think where does the research start in uh, start in cancer and what are those future opportunities for the pharmacists like you know the patient counseling is the the growing uh, area and also the palliative care so in multi specialty hospital might be in near future we have the scope in that way so obviously as a pharmacist we need to think locally as well as nationally and also globally to have a proper skill development in our job or in our uh, future prospects okay so these are the references uh, i use for my presentation so due to the time constraint i try to uh, cover all the aspects that what i want to deliver here okay so thank you and uh, if you have any question always uh, you can just uh, email to me at uh, drfullstoppvingley at gmail.com uh, because there is a the, the time constraint and if there are some few questions we can take now it's up to the the organizer uh yeah hello sir we will take only one yeah. question uh, because now it's uh, 5 pm is a type of the uh, it's a time of uh, another speaker so we will take yeah. only one question uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, here it is in front of you is rice bran oil useful for immunity boosting right yes sir. okay yeah 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 so there are uh, this is a good question actually and this is related with the diet as i told you the diet also plays a important role in the uh you know the uh, many disease condition not even cancerous treatment right so rice bran oil uh, some research already published with the rice bran oil and other uh, dietary factors also and some even uh, they are publishing in the omega 3 fatty acid how it is helpful in the cancerous treatment and rice bran also uh, what i can give the short answer is that uh, it The, it is some uh, somehow in the some literature it is showing some effect some literature still it showing the question mark whether it's really important in the the immunity build up because uh, the key component in the cancer uh, kick up is that uh, immunity right so whenever the person is having the stress because there are uh, consequating factor is not only Uh, about one factor there are a lot of factors we need to think at the one point of time so that's how the diet plays a role stress plays a important role in a cancer treatment okay so rice bran oil is some literature showing the effectiveness some still they are having the question mark and they are suggesting that the meta analysis will be helpful in this particular condition and also the uh, like you know the 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 large trials that need to be done in few regions of the 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 globally it's not all about the one region because uh, every everything is different like you know the the in india itself we have the lot of population that is uh, you know having the lot of different demographic details so that's how uh, we need to learn that aspect in this uh, rice bran uh, this particularly the oil and also the the immunity build up but uh, always i can say you that in a short immunity we cannot build up in a one day it's a life you know it's because of you know some drugs are available still that are uh, helping to uh, have your immunity build up you immunity boost up but that is not always because you know you need to do a lot of things like exercise uh, the diet and having your healthy diet obviously right so if you are using only rice bran oil it's not going to be helpful always right so everything in excess is poisonous to our body we cannot eat everything in excess like salt also like oil also we cannot eat in excess so that's how the principle comes here is a excess things lead to the poison that is a basic principle of pharmacology right so uh, that's how uh, the rice bran having this type of uh, you know the, the 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 things in the literature okay i think uh, there are many things to discuss but uh, with the time constraint i i just to wrap up my answer with this yeah
Thank you, sir. Uh, on behalf okay, of thanks. our beloved principal, sir, thank you for accepting our invitation and for such informative and fruitful session for the future research and career aspects. Dr. Ingay, pedify about the current cancer and nicely deliver information about growth rate of cancer because of junk foods, current lifestyle, tobacco, and some other causes. He also focused on all over cancer treatment like targeted therapy, biomarkers, etc. Adverse effect resistance occurred due to targeted therapy and clinical practice. He also explained challenges and opportunities in cancer research. While discussing about innovation, he expressed his talk on variable injection, injectors, implantable devices, arrayed microinjection, intranasal drug delivery. Thank you, sir, for this excellent insight. Now, moving towards last session, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our next esteemed speaker, Dr. Rahul Manmode. Dr. Okay. Rahul Manmode. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, best yeah. of luck for Dr. Rahul Manmode for his session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, moving towards this last session, I, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our next eminent speaker, Dr. Rahul Manmode. Dr. Rahul Manmode, at present serving as a director, quality control chemistry at Hydrogenics Pharmaceutical Cambridge since 2019 and has total more than 10 years of industrial experience. He has pursued bachelor degree in pharmaceutical sciences at Government College of Pharmacy, Amravati and master degree in pharmaceutical analysis from University of Strathclyde, UK, and PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Massachusetts, and currently pursuing MBA in Eisenberg School of Management, Amherst. Dr. Rahul has professional affiliation with American Chemical Society, Sigma XI, and also serve as a peer review reviewer of scientific journals such as Applied Nanoscience, Carbon and Analyst, etc. He has several publications in peer reviewed journals to his credit. Dr. Rahul is seasoned in guiding cross functional team executing Lean Six Sigma in initiative. His area of proficiency is in leading team developing, validating, transferring, assessing, and improving methods of, for analysis of raw materials, drug substance and product, analytical R&D, quality control testing of raw material, release and stability of drug products. He has strong experience in writing and reviewing technical reports, protocols, SOPs, and regulatory documentations. With this short introduction, I request our esteemed team speaker to deliver his presentation. Please, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you for the introduction. And I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Ingle for a uh, great uh, presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, so my today's presentation is on cancer drug development and regulatory submission strategy and, and practical approach. Uh, all my career I, I spent in industry. Uh, therefore, my presentation will be on practical aspect of drug development as well as regulatory submission. So today, I'm going to talk about three topics. One is drug development. Second is how regulatory body works. And, and there is a brief case study at the end for cancer drug uh, development as well as its approval. So uh, in today's presentation, uh, these this topics itself are, are very vast. Uh, it's, like, it's like teaching Bhagavad Gita in, in one hour. Uh, so today I, I, I put objectives that today on you should be able to get a feel about drug development. And at the end of the presentation, uh, 
I would like you to understand what it really means drug, drug development in industry, uh, because we all have ideas about drug development. Uh, the real question is what happens on ground? The same thing about regulatory bodies. We have a lot of information available online, but the question is how do we execute? What happens really day to day? This is what I would like you to get out of this presentation. I can go into the details, but uh, really that is not the purpose because one hour is not sufficient. Uh, and that's why I want to keep it top level. So uh, my about introduction about me, Madam already gave the introduction. Uh, I, I was born and brought up in a town called as Shendurjanaghat, which is close to Nagpur. I grew up there, uh, lived in Amrati, did my graduate degree, and then went to UK and then US, and I have been working there for several years, about, about 10 years here in US, uh, working in pharmaceutical industry. So I won't spend much time here. So when we are talking about drug development, what we need to understand is what is drug means actually? And we know that there are small molecules, for example, paracetamol or aspirin we get when we got headache. Then there are called as large molecules, something like larger molecule, I would say, not large molecule, uh, something like peptide of, of 300, 3,000 uh, 3, delta or 5,000 delta. -ton. And then there are larger biological molecules like immunoglobulins, antibodies, uh, then insulins. So the molecular weight is increasing. And at the end, the recent one, last couple of decades, we are using AAV, which is virus to deliver drug into human body. So the point of this slide is, to understand that smaller the molecule, easier it is to manage. As size of the molecule goes bigger and larger, it is difficult to characterize it, it is difficult to manufacture it, it is difficult to give it to patient, uh, it is difficult to manage every single way you can think of, uh, like safety, uh, then delivery, uh, we are talking about shelf life. So larger the molecule, complex it is. So even the presentation is about cancer drug. Actually manufacturing process is similar, irrespective of disease, uh, it is going to cure. So I'm I'm just providing here a slide for manufacturing of biological compound like glycoprotein. If it was small molecule, which is mainly in, 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 in India, where uh, our expertise is small molecules, it would have been uh, some chemical synthesis reactions and at the, at the end, uh, uh, hello, hello. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Rahul. Actually, your slide is not visible. You, yeah, you have not shared your uh, PowerPoint presentation. My apologies. Sorry for that. So. I was here. You really didn't miss a lot. Can you see 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 the slide, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible now. All right. Sorry about that. So in my previous slide, I was talking about different sizes of the compound and the complexity of managing them. So this was the slide. So the next one is typical biomanufacturing process where you your drug of interest is protein and how you make the protein. So there are several steps. You need a gene which can produce that particular protein. As you know, 
proteins are made by DNA and the messenger RNA provides message to the cell and cell manufacture protein and in our body we have all proteins around us the way we listen hear talk walk that happens because of protein and some unfortunate individuals uh, do not have one of these proteins or um, or several of them and that's why they get sick so with the new technologies you can manufacture these proteins manufacturing any drug not only protein at small scale is itself is a difficult task but if you are going in manufacturing scale it is very difficult you can it, anything can go wrong it can be as bad as viral contamination uh, less yield uh, the wrong protein preparation so anything you can think about can go wrong so these processes are very well controlled so each step you can think about so here in this slide cell then you have dna then gene of interest then that goes to plasmid that goes to cell cell bank then protein production when it is cooked then you filter it then there is a formulation development then you make make the final product so these are different stages different steps of manufacturing process same thing with small molecule as well so this is typical biomanufacturing process so what is uh, such a big deal about how, why pharmaceutical development is so complex so just think like this you have to prepare this product earlier in the clinical phases and i'm going to talk in the next slide about that you have to prepare it there and then when you go for clinical phases you give it to patient you get the data back and the data says that it is working it is not working it needs to be improved then you go back to this process and then make improvement and then again come back with the new better drug and this process goes on and on and on so many times before you actually discover the final product i, I call it as discover even it is not discovery uh, it is improvement but it is really discovery because there are so many steps involved in them so now you know that you have to make every time better and better product but you need to make a connection between different products let's say a process a1 process a2 process a3 process how do you know at the end is the same drug so there is a something called as comparability study you need to do whenever you change from one process to another process you need to show to regulatory bodies that it is a better product or it is equivalent product it cannot be wrong going in another direction therefore you need to show comparability and comparability itself is is quite complex process because it it needs so many testing and comparison between two processes and data between it and many times or most of the time actually it is not as simple as like that that a was a1 is better than a you need to prove it so let's move on the next slide i want to talk about drug development uh, there are two pictures here uh, the left hand side inverted uh, inverted picture that is that tells you how many molecules you got to start with to get one final product so from pre discovery and drug discovery phase you generally have 5000 to 10000 drugs and then drug molecules 
and then you start in preclinical testing and you do a lot of testing there then you 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 do testing on animals you do testing on cells and you realize that okay this is not working and then you come up with one single molecule and then use that particular molecule in clinical trials clinical trials are where you are injecting or you are giving drug to the real patients and so it is a really serious business because people can die so before that you have to perform all safety efficacy uh, testing you have to you have to pile up a lot of data and submit it to regulatory bodies before you can start clinical trial okay we will talk about clinical trial in next slide and as well as this one but the objective of, of that picture is, is that to show how many drug molecules you got to start with before you can get into real market so the the um, picture at the bottom is discovery and preclinical phases so that is where all research happens some some institution like yours where someone will come up with with a molecule which would say okay this molecule is going to help cure particular type of cancer and that comes with good solid data and one of the company might purchase that molecule and say all right we'll take from here we'll reach out to regulatory bodies like fda us fda or european um, uk mhra and we'll tell them that, okay this is our data and we want to go for a clinical trial and you have to design clinical trial even though it is called as phase one phase two phase three it's a long process phase one itself is split into several cohorts several groups of patients and number of patients is based on which type of disease it is curing for example if it is cancer i mean people are thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people then you need bigger study if you are uh, curing only rare disease uh, that's where uh, you have less pool of patient and you don't need those many patients so these are the steps every step you generate so much data you have to do data analysis then you have to go to to regulatory bodies show it and it goes step by step by step and ultimately uh, either you get approved or not so just to give you perspective about timeline here if you have a kid if you have a boy or girl uh, since birth until that kid goes to high school you can imagine 15 14 15 16 years think about how much efforts you have to put on on your kids the same thing same thing with drug development we are talking about 15 years we are talking about 20 years we are talking about 10 years it's a long period of time and even it looks like it is a long period of time there is so many things to do that you feel every day that you do not have enough time that's how that's how i feel at work that there is no time yeah. so this slide again it is the same slide however there is a point there are points about where is the role of regulatory bodies so white portion is the work of the companies and the blue one it is regulatory bodies time and the cubes you are seeing in yellow those are also where you interact with regulatory bodies like fda so it's not something you are developing drug in vacuum these are regulatory bodies and this is the company you have to be in constantly communication with each other every time you submit a package with the data with your case and they review it and they come up with the question they say all right this is good this is not good you need to improve upon this one 
then you go back, evaluate it, and go back to regulatory bodies and say, okay, we agree on this one, we agree on this one, this is something we need to discuss. And this communication goes on and on and on. There are actual meetings happen between FDA and the committee from the companies. And the preparation of those meetings goes on for months. Uh, so it is not just like hanging around and, and just go and talk with them. It is all scientific discussion based on facts, not based on research paper. It is based on data. You have to prove that your drug is safe. You have to prove that your drug is efficacy. And it is, the burden is on the company, not on FDA. So every time you go to FDA, you need to go with some improvement. And they come up with question and sometimes they say, no, this is not good enough. You got to stop and they can stop. They, they are regulatory bodies. So this communication between companies and regulatory bodies is critical. It is the key for success of any drug molecule to come in commercial phase. Even you may have the best molecule in the world, uh, but it cannot reach to market until you satisfy the requirements of regulatory bodies like FDA. So you have seen that how many people are involved in that process. Engineers, pharmacists, doctors, nurses, legal. You can think about any profession. They are involved in drug development at every different phases. For example, in terms of application for us as a pharmacist, uh, in initial phases, clinical, preclinical, not clinical, preclinical and drug discovery, pharmaceutical chemist, then pharmacologists, they are involved in drug development. Later on, when we are in to, towards commercial commercialization, you need formulation, formulation scientists, then pharmaceutics plays in, in the role, main role. Then throughout the cycle, Chemist plays a big role, whether it is preclinical or whether it is commercial, you have to test your product. So chemist plays a big role in development of the product. So every aspect of pharmaceutical sciences actually contributes in drug development. Uh, this is quality system. I know may, most of you are not from industry, but I wanted to touch base with you on this one. This is very important aspect of drug development. So what FDA says is, if you have not written something, means that never happened. Everything needs documentary proof. They don't budge on that we did it and it is not written. So this is the system, we call this as quality systems. And companies can tamper the data to falsify data and that still happens. There is something called as quality systems where you cannot do it. It is driven by procedures. It is driven by software which has audit trails. So you generate data you cannot just delete it because you did not like it. And quality systems really plays a big role from phase two onwards until commercial, until so on and on. Without that, you cannot release the product. Otherwise, companies can go back and manipulate the data and come up with the product which is not safe. The whole point is to have safe product for patients. And how do you assure that that is happening? How do you assure that manufacturer is manufacturing the product the same way they promised? And that can only be controlled by quality systems. That itself needs a separate presentation, but I wanted 
I wanted to touch base that one. So FDA, now we are moving on the second phase of presentation. What is regulatory bodies? In, in your mind, generally how FDA inspector with, with suit and tie and, and, and with a badge, fancy badge, not really. That's that's not how FDA inspectors are. I, I work with several of them. They, they are like us. They are scientists. They are very collaborative. They understand. It is not easy. They want to work with you because they also have responsibility to bring new innovative drugs to the market so that patient gets the drug they need. If they behave like like a bureaucrat, like like the, the, the top picture, you you it cannot happen. So FDA is always very collaborative. They like human beings like us. So nothing to, to be worried about. You got to be respectful when you speak with them. But it is not something you need to be too much worried about it. They are very transparent, they are very collaborative, and they provide the guidance. And that's what companies need. So if, if you have that thing in mind that they are coming and, and just rejecting your product, that is not the case. If they have to reject the product, there are reasons behind it. Because of either safety, efficacy, we'll talk about that in the next one. So role of what is the role of regulatory bodies? The key role is protecting public health by assuring safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs biological product, medical devices, food supply, and cosmetic. Anything you eat outside your home, anything you take from pharmacy falls under regulatory bodies called as FDA, US FDA, or Indian FDA, EMA, MHRA, P PMDA, Health Canada. Those are five agencies in the world most of the world follows them. And these are almost self-sustained regulatory bodies. Even they are government bodies. Government pays very less. It is generally from commercial environment. You get money. So uh, they also have targets, that means. So US FDA, you may think that it is, it is just like any government office, that, that is not true. Uh, there is a lot of strain on them, of course, a lot of pressure because there are more and more drug molecules coming in, in coming in for uh, marketization. So uh, they have a lot of pressure, but they function as, it would function as like a commercial one, but not exactly commercial one, but, but like commercial one. So, in, in layman's language, uh, regulatory bodies, in fact, can do everything or anything. It's, it's, not, like, uh, it's not like England winning cricket World Cup uh, by, by that crazy rule. Uh, and you cannot do anything about it. Uh, regulatory bodies can do anything, anytime, anywhere in their jurisdiction. They can pull off the drug they approved. They can stop clinical trial. They can stop manufacturing. They can do anything you can think about drugs and full supply. So they have a big role to play for safety of public health. So it's really not wise to lie with them. It is really not wise to, to hide something with them. Need to work with them as a collaborator and not 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 look at look them as as a police they are not police they are there to help you so drug approval process and regulatory regulatory approach so fda gets several application and there are two main type of application one is called as nda which is for drugs which are already discovered, like for example, paracetamol or aspirin. But one of the manufacturing company wants to manufacture it and want to sell it. So that is new drug delivery application, but it is not really new. It is something you are changing something in it and making it better. 
and second one is ind so it is this is this is newly discovered drug this was never went to the market we do not have any experience on that so you need to provide more data it is little more difficult but there are you you can sell your drug for more expensive so there are trade offs between two but and and you would see bla and and and, and all other types of application based on type of type of drug small molecule large molecule we talked earlier uh but they falls under these two categories actually and based on the urgency of that particular drug and therapy in the market regulatory bodies take different approaches do they want to go for fast track for example covid vaccines you have to go for fast track there is no other way uh, whole world is is stand still so you have to go for uh, fast track most of the cancer drugs they go in traditional long path because there are some medicines available for for majority of cancer drugs not perfect solution but there is something there so it is not as urgent as like uh rare disease where there is no therapy available uh, there is a outbreak like covid there is no therapy available so they prioritize based on the requirement of the market and most of the the cancer drugs follows in 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 the longer path okay so regulatory document submission this is from industry side so as we saw earlier that at every stage you have to submit a documentation phase 1 this is this is what we got so how do we put them together and when you write that doc these documents are not 100 pages we are talking about hundreds of thousands of pages we are talking about maybe sometimes more than 10000 pages so all different departments bring their data and they put together and there is always uh, always uh, disagreement so it needs to have collaborative approach there and the key and the most important thing is honoring timeline of the submission because if even it is 15 years as you say trust me 15 years is not enough looking at the data uh, it can take it should take little longer than 15 years but it is not commercially viable uh, and when you when you write regulatory document you really don't want to hide anything but you really don't want to tell more than they need just provide as much as they need and have completely transparent approach okay this is what the data we receive if you need more information we are available and we can provide that so that is very transparent approach it is not something you are hiding anything under rug so this is the last slide actually let me see how we are doing on time all right uh so i just want to walk through the process of this particular case study where the drug this is monoclonal antibody called as uh, trastuzumab uh, which was released in what well, got approval in 2006 just to give you an idea what it takes for for drug development and to bring a uh, drug from research scale to the market in 1980s in 1980s researchers found that there is a gene called as her2 her2 gene that is responsible for breast cancer growth so many researchers spent several years to prove that that is the case actually they discovered it and they they proved it and her2 protein is present at higher level so 
any woman having this protein at higher level had probability of about 30% more of having breast cancer. So that is identified. Now, after a few years, uh, they, they had to prove that blocking this one, someone proved it actually, that if you block this particular protein and it doesn't let it be in, in, in your cell, it won't create cancer or it would at least create cancer at very slow speed. And one way of blocking this particular protein is by creating monoclonal antibody in the lab. And a company called as Genentech and researchers from University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, uh, they collaborated and they came up with this monoclonal antibody, which slows down this HER2 gene. And since then, they started the clinical phases. In about 10 years since they initiated the, the clinical trials, in 1998, uh, the results of phase three clinical trials showed that breast cancers were treated. There was a success using Tratuzumab. So it, look, it took almost 15, 16 years to really find out it works. And after that, about eight years after that, FDA granted approval to that product. So we are talking about 1980s till 2006. It's a long time, a lot of work happens. Again, this time can be shorter or longer, depends on how complex molecule is, what is its role in the society, what it is curing, how many resources companies have to spend money on these clinical trials. As you may know that uh, it takes about $500 million to $1.5 billion for developing one drug from research to the market. Uh, it's not a perfect process, but it takes long time uh, to get from the lab in the hands of the doctor. So your role, you all have a role in, in this product development, whether you are a pharmaceutical chemist, you are, we are pharmaceutics, you are working in, in pharmacology, uh, you all can contribute in this. So with that, I will stop my presentation and would uh, open for any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir, for this nice information. Uh, now we will take uh, around one to two questions and that uh, will conclude the session. Uh, wait for a second, sir. I'm looking for the question. No problem. Okay, so the question is, what is the present status of drug development in COVID situation? Um, um, as far as I know, uh, there are there are three to four molecules which are making good progress. Um, towards clinical trial phase three. They are not in phase three yet. Um, and about over 100 companies are working on, on treatment or, um, or vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, that being said, it is, it's not easy to predict if this, is, this will work or that will work. Uh, unless you do testing on 
big group of patient, it is difficult to confirm that this is going to work. So uh, I, I think that uh, there would be multi-prong approach for, for COVID uh, medication. One is short term and one is long term. We'll find something which is workable solution. Maybe not the perfect, something workable. And that may help increase the herd immunity and ultimately we all will grow immunity. But that is not going to, I don't think that is going to happen in December or January. Uh, this is this is couple of years project at least. Uh, it is going to take time. We, we got to be patient. Uh, the best thing we can do is, is do social distancing. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, here is the second question. So the second question, uh, I oh, missed. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this uh, question is from Deepesh uh, Gamare. How we could approach towards drug development? Do Indian firm give more efforts towards drug development and how much time it takes to make available a drug in the market? So I, I guess the question is, uh, how do we approach it in India to do drug development? A very good question. Uh, really, in, in India, we are we are mainly our strength is at, at at two sectors. I feel one is generic and another is development, like clinical one. So where we can make a good impact. The real challenge is from clinical phases to commercial, and that is a very expensive process. It is not something we cannot do. Uh, but because of all these re, uh, regulations on, on drug market, it is it is quite difficult, or it is it is not give it doesn't give incentive to the companies to uh, invest that much if they want to get money out of it. Everything is all about making making profit. Uh, if companies do not see uh, there is enough profit because there are going to be price control. There is going to be competitor can easily copy my product and just bring it next year. Yeah. Uh, companies don't have incentives. Uh, that is not the case here in, in Western world where you get patent and no one can copy it for 10 years, 12 years, 5 years based on the molecule. So in, in India, I think what is important, so it, it should come from both ends, one from government they should they should come up with a surety to industry that okay your intellectual property will not be uh, stolen and will protect it and second one is from industry from from uh, from stock market where people put more money in drug development because it can be very lucrative business uh, if we treat it as as a business there is an opportunity, tremendous opportunity, so much manpower we have. But if we if we still keep thinking about as a charity, uh, it's, it's difficult to get new drug development in, in India. OK, so uh, thank you, sir, for such a nice information. Uh, and now we will conclude the session with the word of thanks. So for this, I request uh, Ms. Priyanka Bandhadekar. Uh, please, madam. Yes. Sir. On behalf of our beloved principal, sir, thank you for accepting our invitation. Pre-discovery phase, up to its approval. He also explained the quality system, which is a crucial part of drug development to secure journey of product in industries. Dr. Rahul Chris about the role and responsibilities of regulatory bodies like FDA, EMA, MHRA, PMDA, etc. He also discussed about drug approval process, hopefully of Trazuzuma. With this, I conclude the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful session. And yes, thank you, participants, for eagerly attending sessions. Tomorrow is the last day of this three days e-learning, three days e-conference, which will start from 11 a.m. with admirable speakers. Stay safe, healthy, and stay learned. Thank you all. Have a good day.
thank you thank you rahul sir for providing such a nice information sir yeah and apologies for for not sharing earlier slides i know sir not an issue later on yeah yeah actually i found that uh, i think you are changing the slides but it's not visible to our audience so <laughs> i interrupt you <laughs> no thank yeah. thank for that thank thank you it's it's yeah. been real pleasure being being here yeah yeah same here sir uh, so dear participant the feedback link is uh, uh, shared in the chat box so i request you all to please fill up the feedback uh, link and uh, the link is active till 6 pm Uh, so thank you and again tomorrow we have two session the morning session and the evening session uh, the morning session will start at uh, 11 am and it will end at 1 pm and the evening session it will start at uh, 3 pm and it will end at 6 pm so thank you everyone for being here thank you sir. thank you rahul chala